Our subject today is Dim in Politics. And after it, assuming there's time, uh, I've had a number of people ask if I would give just the briefest indication of what's in part three. So if you don't mind my taking a chunk of the question period, I'll try to do that. Let us start with this political system that was dominant at the beginning of the modern era from the late 16th to the mid 18th century. And this system was universally adopted, at least in continental Europe, and it is absolute monarchy. Now the basic principle is that the king is sovereign. In other words, that his power is unlimited. He alone, without needing the consent of anyone, is the legal authority in every matter of state, including economics, the justice system, the police and the military, and, and of course many other areas. In none of these uh, areas does the citizen have any legal right to question or disobey the king's decisions. Now James I of England put it this way in 1609. Quote, kings are justly called gods. They have power to make of their subjects, in other words, to treat their subjects like pawns at the chess, unquote. Now, despite their claim to total power, these monarchs were concerned basically with worldly power. For the most part, they respected the claim of religious officials to spiritual and moral authority. And they would defy such religious officials only when the religion stood in the king's earthly way. For example, when the church vetoed some project of theirs, such as a war or an alliance, which they considered uh, crucial. Now, an absolute monarch obviously can't be asked by his subjects to explain his actions. Because the reason is the king is responsible not to the public, but only to God, with whom he has a unique relationship. As to the public, it's like the masses in Plato's Republic. It's merely an ignorant child in relation to the ruler who is its father. And the duty of children is obedience. Now, there is a system of law in an absolute monarchy. It's not intended that this be a defense of kingly whim. But a law is regarded as a creation of the king and resting on his unique authority. So such a creation clearly cannot limit the king since he always remains, retains the power to drop or change his decrees. And as Filmer, a defender of this system, concludes, quote, kings are above the laws, unquote. Now, if man's powers in general are grants from God, as the 17th century considered self-evident, this must be especially obvious in the case of unlimited power. Who else but omnipotence, capital O, could bequeath such a thing. Thus, the universal defense of absolute monarchy, the divine right of kings. According to this theory, it is God who has chosen and empowered the king out of all the men in the nation. And he has done so in order to have an agent to carry out his will on earth. The origin of the king's right to rule is therefore divine. So you see, divine right. Now, abstract arguments such as I've given you so far were not emphasized, although they were used, because the absolutists liked to provide what they regarded as more specific and decisive evidence for their theory. They regularly cited what they regarded as God's own words, as recorded in the Bible. Uh, Bossuet, a French uh, defender of this, wrote a very influential book entitled 
politics drawn from the very words of Holy Scripture. Uh, and uh, this vast array of biblical references cited by these writers, the most common perhaps was Romans 13, which starts, quote, the authorities that exist have been established by God. Uh, that's a pretty good way to get you somewhere in establishing absolute monarchy. Uh, but there were many other popular passages, including the story of Adam having been awarded supreme dominion over the earth, and the king is the Adam of today, uh, and also the injunction to honor thy father, and the king is the father. Filmer even points out that, quote, there is no text in the Bible which gives people the power of self-government, unquote. So you can't talk about freedom uh, if you believe in the Bible. Now, biblical propositions by their nature rest on faith, not on observation. No perceptual data can lead to God's will and long-range plan, let alone to the Immaculate Conception, the Incarnation, and the whole business. Biblical claims which serve as the axioms of a deductive thought process. Well, that's a clear case of what? Rationalism and of the Augustinian uh, variety here. Now, as a rule, the opposition to absolutists at this time, such as it was, came from non-rationalists. In other words, those of an empirical bent. These men objected to God's alleged endorsement of monarchy by pointing to historical and observational facts. For example, they pointed to the injustice and destruction that were observably perpetrated by certain kings, and this must be counter to God's will. Now, to all such empirical facts, the rationalist defenders turned a deaf ear. The justification of the king's powers, they said, has nothing to do with the facts of history or of utility. They rest on the king's transcendent pedigree. And indeed, the king's rationalist defenders were not beyond dealing with inconvenient facts by offering a deductive proof to the contrary. Confronted, for example, by the objection that absolute rulers are often cruel and even murderous, James constructed a complex deductive chain culminating in the conclusion that whatever the facts seem to be, the real truth is that, quote, every tyrant deserves to desires to preserve the lives and protect the goods of his subjects, unquote. And that's proven a priori regardless of what it seems on the surface. Now, despite their appeal to the transcendent, however, these men did not disdain this world. On the contrary, the king was seen as and regarded himself as God's secular agent, whose duty is to work for his nation's ever greater economic and political uh, eminence and success in this material world. Now, it's interesting to see the contrast here. Many of the king's duties and powers had been carried out by medieval popes as well. But the big difference is that the king was commanded by God in this theory to achieve his country's success in this life. The pope was commanded to oversee men's escape from this life. And so you see the supplanting of the ab absolutist papacy by the absolutist monarchy. And that, although it's absolutism, was a major secularizing of the West. It was the resting, W.R., resting of divine right from the exclusive possession of the church in order to award it to the head of a worldly uh, institution. Now an important difference where the Pope had a big edge. The Pope was believed to be infallible in matters of faith and morals. In other words, to be the sole authoritative interpreter of God's word in those areas. The monarch, by contrast, though absolute, 
was regarded as merely a political, but not an ethical authority. <clears throat> so the king was often criticized, even by his staunchest defenders. He was reminded <clears throat> that he has a moral duty to obey God's laws. <clears throat> so you have a duality <clears throat> excuse me, running through uh, uh, the absolutist approach that was not faced by the popes, uh, uh, but which profoundly undercuts the king's power. Under this system, the citizens are never legally entitled to obey him, to disobey him. But they may very well find themselves in the position of being morally obliged to defy him. So inherent in the system, in other words, because there's moral principles which are absolute prior to an independent uh, uh, of the political system, inherent in that system is the fact that the citizen's conscience must, when his judgment so decides, trump the king's demands. That's a big hole in absolute power. And so uh, the floodgates, you know, it didn't take long for them to start to open. Uh, the king's interpretation of godliness is not infallible. And the citizen must judge in any case, not by the transcendent powers, which they have been told repeatedly ordinary people lack, but by the ordinary cognitive powers of man starting with their experience, their observations. So the power of observable fact began eventually, just by the nature of the system, to displace the mystic insights of Plato's philosopher king. And then that's why by the end of the, of the power of this movement, they were trying the absolutists to justify its claims to power by reference to its observable achievements. In other words, they were trying to harmonize its concepts so far as possible with the data of sense perception. Now, one step further, once the absolute mark was limited in this way in philosophic theory, you can see, I think, that he must end up being limited in practice as well. What other result can ensue when different citizens reach contradictory conclusions, as is their right after consulting their conscience and their observation? When they reach con conclusions contradictory to the king and or contradictory to each other. Now, modern totalitarians, as we'll see, found a solution to this problem. But uh, the kings never could. Uh, someone has put it, I, I don't know who, but it's, it's a marvelous encapsulation of the whole system. Absolutism limited by chaos. Uh, and that really names what it is. Now, the mode of integration, I think you see here. The one is the transcendent, rationalistically known God, from whom flow the many of nature, which are nevertheless viewed as real and important. Or in political terms, the one is the king who is the state. You remember Louis XIV, l'état c'est moi. That's the one binding into a unity by his absolute power many real individuals, so real that in certain respects they're even rightfully independent uh, of the king. So the pattern of this movement is clearly that of M1. And that was, that's true for all these 17th century rationalist movements. All right, let's move to the 18th century now. Uh, the movement undoubtedly you know best, capitalism. Uh, thanks to the 18th century enlightenment, which was largely provoked by Isaac Newton, uh, the absolute monarchies began to collapse, at least in Western Europe. Gradually and partially, they were replaced by capitalism. Now, here again, I'm assuming you know Ayn Rand on capitalism, my book on capitalism. There's nothing in this context that I can say. I, I just review a few points from the point of view of, of Dim. 
The fundamental principle of capitalism was the rights of man. And you know what that entails for the proper function of government and the general working of the system. Now, there are a number of individual rights, but this is not pluralism. <clears throat> because man's rights were not regarded as a disparate collection, but as a unity. Various forms of expression of man's right to life, uh, to self-preservation, as they said. Man's rights in this system are not social. They are natural, natural rights. Natural in the sense that they're based on the facts of reality. And those facts were at this time called natural law. And man's rights were unalienable, which is an enlightenment language for eternal, immutable, uh, absolute. <clears throat> Absolutes which no one may properly ignore or infringe. So in both respects, people were saying there is no essential difference between Newton's revered and recently discovered laws of uh, physics and their newly discovered laws of politics. Uh, they consider it has the same scientific status based on the same data. And in this view, of course, you know that government is the servant, not the master uh, of the uh, individual. It's nothing but a policeman charged with arresting criminals at home or abroad. Or as Jefferson put it, it's concerned only with that which, quote, picks my pocket or breaks my bones, <clears throat> unquote. Now, the founding fathers, with an occasional exception, uh, rejected the monarchist pessimism in regard to human nature, their original sin, the idea that the masses are helpless, and their call for powerful government as essential to restrain all this corruption boiling and seething within men. The individual the Founding Fathers held, and here they reflected the whole Enlightenment, possesses the wonderful faculty of reason. And rational beings do not need fear or fits to keep them peaceful. Criminals apart, they need merely to be set uh, free to think. So Plato is wrong in holding that truth is denied to the mass of citizens. And Aristotle is right that truth is open to all. So there is in this era no longer any clash between seeing and believing. And if you want an enjoyable experience, you should read Thomas Jefferson's thoughts when he completed Plato's Republic. His stupefaction, the junk of this sort, was raised to the level of a classic. And what he calls it, no one today would even dream of that language. <clears throat> so he definitely knew that Plato was out. <clears throat> now, the Enlightenment was a rejection not only of original sin, but of religion in general. As you can say, they kicked supernature upstairs, and they threw out faith, including Christianity, altogether. Reason, the only oracle of man. And it was in this atmosphere uh, uh, that capitalism was born. In its every distinctive element, American politics was a secular phenomenon. What proportion of the population do you think at the time of the Constitution went to church? 10 to 15 percent. Uh, and there was a strong, as one book puts it, quote, there was a strong national consensus existed on the utterly secular nature of the federal government. And, of course, most of them on the state governments also. Now you can see this secularism in the nature of the values encompassed by the politics of natural rights. Every one of these rights is worldly, even materialistic, through and through, and would have been sins, if not crimes, some centuries earlier. What the system was designed to protect, protect was self-preservation, not self-sacrifice. Material wealth, not spiritual poverty. The profit motive, not the God motive. Self-assertion, not obedience. Happiness, 
not duty, and one's own personal happiness here and now. You can imagine how that would have gone over in the 13th century. Uh, consistent with its secularism was the Enlightenment's conviction following Locke that knowledge is founded not on innate or a priori ideas, but on experience, i.e. on perceptual data. Like Newton, they regarded such data as the beginning, not the end of knowledge. From sense experience they held, men could abstract, generalize, deduce, in a word, conceptualize, and thereby discover universal laws of man, nature, and politics. As to rationalism, they tended to agree with Locke's barb that it was easy, quote, to be sure without proofs and to know without perceiving, unquote. And if you notice, the Declaration of Independence proclaims as its justification not innate ideas, but, but principles which, quote, all experience hath shown, unquote. Now, the founding fathers, like uh, Enlightenment thinkers in general, were not atheists. Characteristically, they were deists who believed in God but cut his connection to life on earth. This was a fading remnant of religion in no way essential to the capitalist view. The most well-known case of the founders' appeal to God is their view that God is the creator of man's rights. Since rights, however, are an aspect of natural law, this claim is on a par with the claim in physics that God created physical law. It's another case, and there were many such cases uh, in this era, in which God was claimed to produce a phenomenon, such as this world, its laws, man's faculties, his rights, at which point he was pushed to retire from the scene and left man to discover, use, and or deal with what he produced unaided in a purely secular fashion. So it was the last remnant. God was, was no longer part of life or the universe. He just uh, 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 retired. Now, this doesn't mean that there aren't occasional uh, inconsistencies and ambiguities. People make a lot of the statement, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And doesn't that a rationalist uh, principle? I'll answer that in the question period if you want. I don't think that it is, although I wouldn't have put it in. And Jefferson hadn't put it in. He said, uh, incontrovertible, incontrovertible and sacred. And Benjamin Franklin came in and said, it's too long. Change it to self-evident. So uh, in my view, it's essentially a literary issue, not a statement of rationalist epistemology. But... You know, you can write a whole book on those two words. In essentials, however, leaving aside their occasional uh, ambiguities and inconsistencies, the founding fathers are, in essentials, the offspring of Aristotle. And the basic reason I've argued in the ominous parallels, that is because Aristotle's philosophy is the Enlightenment's philosophy. And the essence of it is secularism without skepticism. And without skepticism, because percepts are the base, but can and must be conceptualized. So I think you can see their views on integration. Many rights derive from one principle. And therefore, the many functions of government in protecting those rights derive from the same one principle. The one principle of self-preservation. And as a result, practically, the capitalist state is one in still another sense. The citizens cannot clash systemically. In other words, by the nature of the system. Tearing apart the one nation into warring pressure groups. Since the system recognizes and protects only interests which fall within the principle of individual rights. In other words, which leave unimpaired the autonomy, the, uh, including the property, of each of the citizens. There is no way that they can form to uh, expropriate 
uh, another group because the only way that that would be would be through government power, and the government doesn't have that power. And consequently, you have a truly harmonious system. There are obviously individual fights and feuds, but none that streak through and characterize uh, the entire uh, system. So now we just need to note that while the one is real, the many have primacy in politics. The one of the state is a derivative of the choices and interests of the many and our many observations of the world. So the one here does not supersede or swallow up the many. It's a one in the many. Or perhaps in this case more exactly, a one out of the many. And I think the founders said it best in Latin, a pluribus unum, one out of the many. So they, they knew something about their mode of integration. Now capitalism, therefore, is clearly the I mode. Now the next in order is a system I call political pluralism, very similar to what we saw under educational uh, pluralism. This is by the later decades of the 19th century. A new approach is rapidly replacing capitalism throughout the West. The best known names of the, this system is mixed economy and the welfare state. The welfare state is a later stage of uh, the mixed economy, which wasn't introduced in the United States until Franklin Roosevelt although the mixed economy went back decades before that. Now, if we call this political pluralism, we know that pluralism is the advocacy of many logically unrelated factors as a primary in a given question. The political pluralist denies that there is any one basic function of government, such as carrying out God's will, or protecting man's rights. On the contrary, he says, there are many <clears throat> proper governmental activities, and these are not reducible to any abstract unifying principle. Under the right circumstances in this view, a government may or should, among other things, for instance, prevent monopoly, ensure full employment, non-obscene TV, and safe drugs, prohibit discrimination, protect free speech and private property, eliminate the teaching of evolution, protect the individual from unwarranted intrusion by the government, redistribute wealth so as to aid the needy, and much more. Now, many governments throughout history have performed a variety of unrelated tasks, but they have done so eclectically with no attempt to defend this approach intellectually. The modern pluralists are not eclectics. They have a very explicit philosophic uh, defense of their position. Pluralists, I may say, disagree among themselves as to what specific functions the government should perform. But they do not disagree over the pluralist viewpoint. On the whole, the ones that are called conservatives today <clears throat> favor an array of religiously based functions, the liberals of economic functions. Now, the growth of government <clears throat> in the pluralist approach is evident. No longer is the state restricted to the capitalist role of watchman over inalienable rights. The very idea of natural rights in this view, simply is arbitrary. It has no basis. Can you see a right? Uh, and therefore, Comte himself put natural rights in the category of metaphysics. Uh, it's as bad as Adams. Uh, men do have certain rights in this view, but their source is that which alone is observable. And of course, that is society. And needless to say, what society's laws protect is not an absolute. Now, pluralists insist that they are not advocates of all-powerful 
the government. Now, I'll quote you from Washington Gladden over a century ago, uh, who's still very representative. He worked to bring about a substantial expansion of government. But when he was accused of being a socialist, he said he did not wish government to, quote, empty the horn of plenty at every man's door, unquote. The pro-capitalists, he said, now listen to this, would f have government fill none of man's wants, except a police function. The socialists would have it fill all of them. In contrast, the pluralist shuns both none and all. In Gladden's words, the government should fill, and what is the word instead of all or none? Many of the people's wants and provide for many of their uh, necessities. And these many items, of course, have no necessary uh, interconnection. Uh, <coughs> you see, in Thanny's language, the one and the many just comes up everywhere by the people themselves. The pluralists say that what they want to combine is the good, good elements of the previous approaches while dropping inflexibility. For instance, they claim to cherish individual freedom and mandatory social service, property rights, and equality through redistribution. And there's a whole list of them. But Gladden has the perfect, easily rememberable solution. What they are trying to combine in one system is, quote, Liberty and love, unquote. Uh, now, both capitalists and socialists uh, criticize all these com combinations as self-contradictory. But the pluralists reply that they reject extremism in favor of the middle of the road. And the capitalists and the communists say, well, how can you... What do you stand for then? What's your intellectual base? And they uh, uh, say, we reject ideology. We reject the whole idea of a philosophic basis. The mixed economy needs no ideology to underpin it, precisely because it is not an abstractly conceived, quote, system. You know, they hate system building in politics just as they, they do in philosophy. And this is the best summary I've been able to write of what is their actual view. The mixed economy is not a system. <clears throat> in their view, it is a conjunction of concretes, of specific changing answers to specific changing problems each of which must be dealt with piecemeal and empirically on its own unique terms, not lumped together with others by reference to some kind of so-called holy general principles, rigid absolutes, a priori conceptual schemes. Now here you see not an outright rejection of abstract thought in politics, but a big step forward in cons or downward in conceptual shrinkage, a big step toward perceptual level function. It's not outright rejection because the pluralists are not extremists here either. To some extent, they say, political policy making depends on generalization from experience. But the general relations, the generalizations and causal relationships that they discover are sought out only to resolve a very specific concrete problem. And therefore, the generalizations that satisfy them are very lower level, much lower, uh, much narrower in scope than, than any of their political predecessors would have been uh, content with. Now, if you ask uh, by what means is one to deal with and resolve a specific political economic problem, 
uh, without reference to principles, uh, I assume you know the, that they simply would say, we want an answer that works for society, at least for now. And we can discover that by the only standard that is observable. What can you observe that would be a test of uh, a solution? You can only observe what people want. Therefore, the good has to be what people want. So whatever solution satisfies people's desires at the moment, that's the answer and the resolution. Of course, those desires are subjective, but that's irrelevant from their point of view because all desires are subjective and all values are subjective. Well, then, what happens when men's feelings clash in a particular case? And the answer, in the end, always comes down to the necessity of compromise. No matter what the demands of the contending parties, they should find some kind of meeting ground each give up some part of their demand, since none of them can claim to be more objectively right than the others. Now, this approach to integration, I think, is, is obvious. They are avowedly secular champions of the many, although they, w without the one, although they allow within the many a series of clusters of unrelated generalizations of many ones. So that's obviously D1. And that's obviously by far the dominant political viewpoint today in the United States. I mean, we have very few advocates of absolute monarchy and fewer of capitalism. So. <laughs> All right, now let's go to totalitarianism. Again, communism to its politics. And I think I have for you a substantially deeper presentation now, uh, because we've reached politics, and from which you will see that their approach to literature and education is just an obvious deduction. Now, in principle, totalitarianism is a continuation of absolute monarchism. But whereas the 17th century monarchs had to accept a variety of restrictions on state power, the totalitarians accept no such restrictions, whether advanced as the demand of God, nature, or the people. The proper state in this view must actually be all-powerful. It must control every aspect of a citizen's life without limit to the actions it uh, should take. So we just sweep out any concept of indiv individual rights, private property, personal liberty. All of that is the remnants of a decadent past which must be obliterated. Now the total totalitarians actually achieved in practice this kind of control. And it's often said that um, this was because of the advances of technology in our times. I think there's a little bit of truth to that, but I think if you knew more about what went on in the Middle Ages, you wouldn't be so much in a rush to say how much more power and control uh, the Kremlin had uh, than uh, the Vatican. But let's wait Oh, two or three years to get to that. Now, I assume you know that the Marxists describe themselves... Oh, I left out a paragraph. The beneficiary of, commun of the state is, of course, a collective, and the collective that counts for communism is economic classes. Now, the Marxists, I'm sure you know, make a lot out of the fact that they are the complete opposite of Plato and uh, religion. They are hard-headed, this worldly materialists. They de even deny many of them the existence of consciousness. And they offer the economic interpretation of history. A society so-called material forces of production inevitably come into conflict with its property relations. 
leading to class struggle, leading to the overthrow of the ruling class, thereby spawning a new conflict, which forms a new class struggle, etc. So every economic system contains the seeds of its own destruction, and history, in, in essence, is no more than the record of this progression. Now, since economic factors ultimately determine everything else, this is called economic determinism, economic interpretation of history, and therefore economic determinism. Well, is, isn't there a causal role in human life for something other than economics, like ideas, uh, value judgment? And their answer is zero, no. All these things that the bourgeoisie rhapsodize about, free will, ideas, morals, religions, philosophy, that is a mere, quote, superstructure. In other words, it's a mass of subjective rationalizations uh, of uh, one's economic position dictated by your economic class and in any event, impotent to affect uh, life. Well, let's go a little deeper and ask, <clears throat> why does reality necessarily follow over and over class struggle, new class struggle, etc.? And the Marxists say this is an inevitable expression of the basic law of reality. The basic law of reality being the dialectic process. Uh, I mentioned it briefly under Hegel. Uh, so you see, if you put the two together, dialectic materialism is the name of their philosophy. And the idea of this, which they took straight from Hegel, is that reality can develop itself only in a succession of triads. There's the thesis, which generates its contradiction, the antithesis, both of which are then united in a synthesis, which is a union of both, an identity of opposites, A and non-A. And this synthesis then generates a new, higher synthesis, which pulls along the older ones, and its opposite, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Economic determinism, uh, uh, therefore, is really nothing more, they say, than a materialistic or worldly interpretation of Hegel's dialectic triadic uh, movement. But Hegel did it in terms of triads of ideas. They do it in terms of triads of economic consideration. Aristotle, therefore, is dead wrong. It is not true that A is A. The exact opposite is true, and they have no hesitation in stating this. Reality is a flow of contradictions, and its basic law is A is A, and also non-A. Now, since the dialectic flow, in Hegel's view, uh, is the process <clears throat> of realities coming to maturation, or let's say growing to adulthood. Reality, in effect, starts as a, as a baby and grows up, and that's the whole world process. Obviously, one day it's going to reach the completion of its growth. <clears throat> it will achieve perfect self-development, at which point the progression of conflicts and contradictions will cease. Uh, and the Marxists follow Hegel here as well, though in their economic terms. History, they hold, is teleological, which means goal-directed, purposive. It's always been moving toward a final, unchanging, and noble state, which, near the end of its run, uh, as the, I was going to say, as reality is graduating from college, <clears throat> it reaches in two stages. The last part, the final. The preliminary preparation and then the ultimate culmination. Or the dictatorship of the proletariat and the classless society. Or the way the communists themselves put it, socialism and then communism. Now, during the first stage, every remaining trace of capitalism is eliminated. And to achieve this end, the leadership of the state, 
must employ every means necessary with no restriction on its actions, including mass slaughter, if necessary. Now you, you might say, well, according to economic determinism, the elimination of the capitalist mentality should follow simply from the adoption of public ownership of the means of production, as economics dictates. But Lenin found that even under socialism, a good part of the proletariat was still being influenced by the old society which it had overthrown. <clears throat> and thus arises in the theory of communism the need of a party, a communist party, which was not an early development, a party of communist intellectuals who would be the vanguard of the revolution, who are devoted to bringing up to speed the unenlightened masses. <clears throat> now follow this one. Since the party is a necessary stage in the march of history, it's therefore an essential constituent in the very development of reality itself. Well, if so, it must be infallible, because how can reality be wrong? So in this way, Lenin and his followers, very much in contrast to the absolute monarchs, take on all the power all the moral and other authority of the Pope. That's the first time that has been done since the medieval period. Now the uh, final ending of the stream of dialectic conflicts, Marx tells us, will be the first holy moral system in history. And that is the classless society. It will be moral because there will be no element of egoism in it. And its rule will be rather from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, unquote. And Marx was asked, <clears throat> this doesn't sound very original. Communist morality sounds just like Christian. And he said, yes, but the difference is they preach it. We're going to practice it. So... <laughs> Now, once the class of society is reached, <clears throat> there will no longer be any need for a state because a state is nothing but a tool of class exploitation, in their view. So, when there's no longer classes, uh, the state, along with the secret police, the army, the bureaucrats, and the whole apparatus of totalitarianism will, quote, wither away, unquote. Now, this has been regarded by anti-communists as a real mystery. Uh, but uh, Khrushchev, <clears throat> I think, makes the clearest statement <clears throat> about this mystery, how such withering is possible. <clears throat> i just quote you one sentence from him. He says, the period of time it will require, quote, will be a very long one. <laughs> That's as honest as they get. Another one, I think Stalin says, it's a contradiction, and that's the nature of reality. So you should be, you know, we're, we're being consistent with ourselves in saying the impossible can happen. Now, the Marxists, as I started by saying, regard their whole philosophy as derived from observation, as realistic and scientific, and they regard a priori ideas of the rationalists as unscientific vaporings on which they have only, for which they have only contempt. But if you watch the Marxist epistemological uh, procedure, what they do is, for any given crucial idea of this, first they ferret out some observational data that's relevant to and seems to support their theories, and then, having got off the, the ground, they drop the whole concern with observation and look for real support elsewhere. And I quote now from a Marxist writer, Louis Dupre, who illustrates this with regard to the validation of the dialectic process. 
In Marx's view, I'm quoting, the dialectical principle is much more than an empirical description. A mere empirical study of facts can provide a hypothesis, or at most a theory, but it can never predict with the absolute confidence which gives Marxism all its power and influence. The mind may start its study of facts in an empirical way, but as soon as it discovers its own rationality in these facts, it takes over and becomes a priori. In other words, as soon as it gets up the ladder at a certain point, it throws the ladder away and becomes rationalistic, independent of experience. And uh, in the book, I have many more, well, at least three or four more examples of that uh, exact same uh, approach. So judging both by the content of ideas and their method of validating them, the base of modern communism is not observation, but Hegel the rationalist. They just take it over by the same method, the same content, and give it uh, a material veneer. Now, where are we then? A system of a priori truths means dualism. There's a world of percepts and a world of concepts. Or the sensible world and the world of ideas. Or nature and supernature. Metaphysically, then, the question is, what divides rationalists? Uh, we know the issue was, what is their attitude to the sensible world? the physical world. Is it real or not? So do the Marxists on this issue follow Descartes or Plato? Well, I say they follow Plato through the agency of Hegel. They follow Hegel metaphysically and epistemologically. But first, metaphysically. If reality grows up in stages, then there is a distinction between the underlying, unobservable reality that's doing the maturing or evolving and its many superficial, observable stages. Some stages are lower, farther from the completed reality, while others are higher, closer. And by definition, a lower stage is quickly eclipsed by the dialectic process. The highest stage, by contrast, is immutable. A lower stage is still countless triads away from the ultimate good at which history aims. The highest stage is that ultimate good. In other words, there is an immutable, perfect reality hidden behind the scenes, a reality discovered purely by conceptual thought. And then there is also a lesser superficial manifestation of it that we grasp by sense perception. Now, the Marxists do not use the language of idealism. They speak instead of higher and lower stages of the dialectic. But they might equally well, with the same meaning, have expressed their viewpoint by speaking, as Hegel did, of reality and appearance. Or, for that matter, as Augustine did, of God and his uh, creation. Now, as to epistemology, Descartes used his a priori, priori ideas in an effort to understand this world. Marx, however, uses his in order to downgrade and even, if need be, to dismiss worldly facts. Now, I want to give you a quote from Engels which you won't believe because I didn't. But he was writing on the Hegelian premise, famous Hegelian premise, the real is rational and the rational is real. Or more colloquially, whatever happens in true reality is wonderful. And whatever is wonderful happens in true reality. <clears throat> and here is Engel. The quote, the real or rational cannot be equated with existence because much of what exists is irrational and therefore unreal. 
For example, in 1789, the French monarchy existed, but was not real. Unquote. Now, these are the materialists scornful uh, of ideas not based on observation. Now, no one but a thorough Platonist uh, uh, could believe such a thing. <clears throat> if facts must be regarded as unimportant or unreal, if and when a higher reality defined by the world of ideology so demands, then you see the totalitarians within that framework are absolutely right in deducing, without reference to observation or induction, simply deducing uh, the proper interpretation of science, education, art, and every other uh, department of culture. Well, this movement's approach to integration is clearly the same as Hegel's. It is Hegel with a, a modest veneer and made international instead of national. All things in this view are manifestations of a transcendent reality, the one in relation to which this world of the many and sense perception of the many is ephemeral and unreal, the one without the many at all. And that is clearly M2. And now I get to the, the newest, the latest trend in the West politically. All right. What I have in mind is uh, the latest approach to sweep the political scene. And it didn't start till, oh, I would say... 60, 70, 1960 or 70, and that is egalitarianism. I have written this part about six times because capitalism, communism, all that, I can be calm about it. I spent forever doing it. But this is the first time I've ever done egalitarianism. And I get so enraged, I had, because I'm supposed to be, you know, by the requirements of the book. I'm just discussing the mode of integration. Uh, I couldn't get all the anger out, but if you think this is angry, you should only see what it started off to be. <laughs> Egalitarianism is the advocacy of equality as the fundamental moral value, and therefore as the standard of good and evil. Equality in this context does not refer to men's equality before the law. Nor does it mean equality of opportunity, which had been advocated by the older welfare status. And they had argued that society must see to it that all men are equally equipped at the start to achieve success in life, and that thereafter they should be left at least reasonably free to compete, with some becoming winners in the process and others losers. The egalitarians reject that idea of equality because they say that owing to factors beyond their control, some men are simply unlucky in life and can never be equally equipped with the others no matter what society does. So if equality is to be real, they conclude, society must concern itself primarily not with the start of a man's endeavors, but with their end. The moral principle must be not equality of opportunity, but equality of result or equality of income. In regard to any value of significance, every man is equally entitled to it. It is immoral, therefore, for a man to compete with others in the attempt to secure for himself or his loved ones an unequal share of the good things of life. Now, the most common, but by no means the only, value stressed by this, these theorists is money or material wealth. If equality is the essence of justice and morality, then the disparity between rich and poor is by definition unjust and immoral. Now the egalitarians, you must understand what they agree with you on to understand what they're saying. 
the egalitarians readily acknowledge that some men produce values which are greater than those produced by others. They, most of them have no problem agreeing that such men usually succeed at production through their own effort, thought, and hard work. Now you might say, well, then what? Well, they say this fact does not justify the conclusion that producers have earned their product or deserve to keep them. And the reason is that a man's intelligence, his character, and all his productive attributes are a result of luck. His luck in what they call the lottery of nature, which gave him his superior brain, and his luck in being born and raised in a superior environment. And of course, both of those he had nothing to say about. He did nothing to earn. So so-called achievement brings a man no greater moral claim or credit than that already possessed by every other man, whether he's productive or otherwise. The only significant dis distinction among men, they say, is the different cards. Reality has arbitrarily dealt them in the game of life. And just as uh, Peter Singer is one of them, just as in his words does not allow us, quote, to reward the lucky and penalize the unlucky, unquote. So we have to throw out the traditional idea that justice is giving every man his due. Justice, on the contrary, is fairness. And fairness for this school means the elimination of reality's unfairness. Now, I've said that they're not concerned only with inequalities of wealth. Their demands to abolish inequality are largely unprecedented throughout the whole recorded history of man, and they grow all the time. Now, I, I mean, I know you know about feminists who demand equality for women by fighting what they call male chauvinism. Uh, you know that there's whole groups of activists among the aged who are fighting ageism. The handicapped are fighting ableism. The able should not get more than the handicapped. The ugly are fighting lookism. And, you know, it, it just goes on. And the, the multiculturalists are fighting imperialism, which they define as the idea that the West thinks itself as any way better than the rest of uh, the world's cultures because all cultures, like everything else, is equal. Then there are the animal rights activists who are fighting speciesism. And they want us to recognize the equality with man of all sentient creatures. Now, all of the above require legal remedies. Uh, most of which are already in place. Uh, and uh, very often conservatives have no more problem with them uh, than liberals. Redistribution of wealth. But the real ones want not only within the U.S. but around the world. Affirmative action. Giving community activists voting rights on corporate boards so that the powerless can share equally in running the institutions that, in their words, quote, affect our lives, unquote. In general, not to give you a continual list, they want to ban all practices which lead to a distinction between winners and losers, and thereby inequality. They are against uh, the announcement of class rankings, you know, first, second, third. They do not want the employee of the month to be named. They oppose Oscars for the best movies, scores for athletic games, and beauty contests. Now, since competition, uh, working to do better than others, is the antonym of egalitarianism, 
This must be stamped out. And the director, believe this or not, of the Van Cliburn International Piano Competition said that he knew the way to, to stamp out competition. What we must do, he said, is, quote, stamp out the concept of the better, unquote. Now, all these measures, and I've already touched on them, add up to a sizable expansion of government power. But they say this is no threat to liberty. Of course, it's a threat, they say, to liberty. If you mean the old-fashioned, outdated, archaic, absolute liberty of the Enlightenment, but if you're talking about modern uh, liberty, relative liberty, well, sir, we agree that people need relative liberty. And so, since we give people what they need as long as they get it equally, you'll get that in an egalitarian state as well. So in other words, no one will have inalienable rights, but we will all by definition have equal alienable rights. Now, John Rawls, the modern creator of this movement, states the theory a bit differently because he fears that expropriation of the producers might lead to bad consequences for the poor and downtrodden. But despite this, he forgets it and goes on that ethics is not concerned with consequences. Ethics is not concerned with consequences, not of any kind. When we decide on what to do morally, Men's happiness has nothing to do with it, whether it leads to men's happiness, whether it leads to the welfare of the poor. Consequences are irrelevant. Morality, he says, and the whole movement adopts this, prescribes unconditional obedience to one primary only, which must be obeyed no matter what, and that is the moral law itself, and that is the principle of equality. So for this whole movement to achieve equality is the categorical imperative and the only one, the basic principle, defining moral action and the moral life. Now you might ask, how do these people validate the egalitarian viewpoint? The claims are somehow based on observation or deduce it from something. And I think the best is to quote you from Dworkin, one of the professors, because he's pretty typical. Quote, If one does not agree that men have a right to equal respect, regardless of merit, I do not know how anyone could show this belief to be true. I do not know how in any way one could prove it or show that if one is through and through rational, one must accept it." Unquote. So in other words, it has no objective basis, neither in the world of experience nor in any rationalist realm of the a priori. So it can't be justified, we're told already, as a means to an end. And it's not a self-evident end in itself. So it's just there floating. How then do we know how to interpret it, how to apply the theory? Since neither experience nor reason are said to be relevant to reaching it. For instance, suppose you ask, are all inequalities equally bad? Or are some more deserving than others of society's concern? Well, all we're told is, you must eliminate inequalities. But for instance, take this situation. Uh, the ugly, you know, grouping. 
a pressure group for the ugly. The ugly, the homeless, the neurotics, and the animal advocates all petition Congress for equality. One wants massive plastic surgery. One wants residential construction. One wants psychotherapy. One wants a redistribution of protein between men and the animals. Now suppose, that's, and certainly true, that society just simply cannot afford to satisfy all these and a hundred other requests. How does an egalitarian know, you know, which ones to pick? To some people, a man's looks are relatively unimportant, and he'd rather give the money to otters. Uh, while to others, his looks are crucial to his ability to socialize and thus to be fulfilled in life. Now, if you read their books looking for answers, as I have, I mean, you know, five or ten books, that's as much as you can stand. Um, egalitarians are not disturbed by, quote, abstract questions like these. People, they, they generally say, already know what they want and what they really need. They feel what they want. So we don't need some kind of theoretical uh, system or uh, textbook hierarchy uh, of values. Start anywhere. Jump in. Attack injustice wherever you feel strongly about it. Uh, assuming, they always put in, assuming that you could hope to get some remedy, some political uh, uh, remedy that the situation is ripe for that. Don't beat your head against stone wall. Almost none of them are utopians. They want to work within today's society and knock down uh, uh, inequalities one at a time wherever they think they can get uh, a, a hearing. Now you see here the concrete bound perceptual level approach of the movement. They decide in each case by reference to arbitrary emotion. Their own or that of others. There's a Heraclitian flux of social sores and they just jump in the river uh, and go with it wherever they feel it. Like. Now let's go a little deeper into this movement. Because the, the good thing about them is they say what they mean, which is a shocking thing. They do not want to be misunderstood. So they freely admit, they even stress uh, the fact that in almost every respect, men are, in fact, unequal. Now, it's common for people to say, oh, your theory is ridiculous. Some people are intelligent, some are dumb, some are good, some are bad. They say, of course, we don't deny that there's vast differences, and we don't ever expect to change these differences. We're not out to you know, make every human being interchangeable. So the fact, there's no use going up to them and saying, you know, all the differences. We agree. Their, their point is, this fact is unfair. So in the name of justice, we must ignore it. And in fact, we must reverse it. In other words, we must act as though its opposite were true. Men are not equal in reality. Granted, they say but they are equal in our moral theory. So we don't work for the eradication of human differences. That is a utopian uh, and pointless task. Uh, we simply ask you to make moral choices as, as if the differences had already been eradicated. Now, how are you justifying saying, well, there are all these differences, but ignore them. And their answer is, we just showed you that these differences are morally irrelevant. Are morally irrelevant. Remember, all the roots of these differences of good and evil are luck. So all the attributes you have 
are just the lucky, non-moral offspring of your lucky, non-moral endowments. And that has nothing to do with morality. So the only differences that count is what is left when you strip off everything that's a matter of luck. And uh, Rawls calls this the veil of ignorance. It's you, you put each man in a situation where he's ignorant of any of his non-moral attributes. In other words, of any of the attributes that distinguish him from others. You make yourself in thought your pure self, stripped of any feature irrelevant to morality. In other words, you're stripped of your brain, your character, your desires, your appearance. It's all gone. Well said, Rawls, then, and now we're talking about morality, then everybody is identical to everybody else. And therefore, everyone will vote for egalitarianism because there's no conceivable grounds to pick himself over somebody else. What do you think of that for an argument? This is widely taught, accepted, uh, and being implemented in our culture now, it has a passionate core of followers of which the mixed economy doesn't anymore. They're just old uh, hangers-on waiting to be replaced. Now, Aristotle said that A is A. To be is to be something. But Rawls and the others reject this position. The source of a just claim, what makes a claim just, is not your character, but precisely what? Your lack of character was left when that stripped away. The source of a just claim is that it is presented by an existent without identity by a man without attributes by a man who is nothing in particular in other words who is nothing who doesn't exist if men are morally the same as the egalitarians say it's because they are the same in being equally nothing so what makes a man deserving in this view, is not what he is, thinks, feels, or does. It is the zero at his core. Now, you know what nothing is in Latin. <laughs> now, but there's another name for this zero buried within you, which hands out moral commandments, which demands universal sacrifice. I don't know if you know the history of philosophy, but what, those of you who know it, what would that be called? The noumenal self, the self in itself, Kant's idea of uh, uh, the, the source of uh, morality. So this is obviously a rewording uh, of Kant. And uh, I should say, Rawls has boasts about that. He doesn't hide his Kantianism. He even calls his book at one point what is the word, uh, an elaboration or uh, just a little development from Kant that Kant gets most of the credit, which is true. <clears throat> now, from, act uh, from Atlas Shrugged, you already know the practical results uh, of this viewpoint. Now, I'm not supposed to talk about consequences, but I'm now giving an objectivist. Uh, since the bottom is among men, are held to be helpless, we can gain the necessities of justice only from the tops and only by exploiting their abilities and expropriating their values while withholding gratitude or praise which producers never deserve. So in general, the rational, the competent, and the Western must be pulled down and or frozen out so we can pull up to equality 
They're opposite. Now, Anna Sugar was written in 1957. And she was told on Rand many times, it's an exaggeration. It could never happen. Just a few laws you don't like, and suddenly you're projecting to a whole society. I wish she could have lived to hear people say and write things like, those who succeed, this is my summary, those who succeed in the pursuit of a value are to be sacrificed to the non-succeeders because they are non-succeeders. That is all over this movement. Or value achievement leads a man to loss, non-achievement leads him to gain. Uh, and here, I think, is the absolute lowest statement I've ever read. I can't say that in the book, but I can say it to you. One egalitarian put the point as follows. It, is, it is essentially says that we bring down the, quote, high flyers, unquote. That we bring them down. I don't think any communist would, would have said that. And afterwards, if you ask, what will happen to mankind, including all those low flyers who can't even get off the ground? And by your theory statement, they're doomed on their own to helplessness and failure in life. And you're going to bring down the high flyers, and they're the only ones that keep the, the rest functional. What do you think is going to happen to the human race? Now, I have found two different answers from the egalitarians to this question. The first is, well, so what? Consequences are irrelevant to morality. Equality is what counts. Now, I, I read an eloquent statement of this particular answer from Paul Pot, the dictator of, one time dictator of Cambodia, who was once an egalitarian. And this is in a description of him, quote, after the first year of Khmer Rouge, foraging for food was denounced as a manifestation of individualism. Some might wind up with more than others. Better that all should starve equally. Unquote. And now the second egalitarian response that I have heard to the prospect of mankind's destruction by this theory is good. And this is given by the most consistent representatives of the movement, the new, uh, I guess you have to call them nature lovers, in the ecology movement. Now, remember, that follows inevitably. It's a form of egalitarianism. Don't think that this ecology movement is some kind of separate Equal respect, remember, is merited by an existent independent of its identity. That is the whole essence of the thing. So it's merited just as much by an inanimate object as by human beings. When you take away identity, what you've got left is nothing in particular. And if that's what justifies the demand for respect, nature has every right to the respect uh, that we do. And that's merely the conclusion that these people draw from egalitarianism. So a river must not be uh, molested by dams, a field by piercing it to loot its coal, etc. And since the, greater, the greatest offender against nature is man, then there's only one remedy, and that is to exterminate him. Egalitarians are obviously nihilists and ambitious ones. They don't confine themselves to special fields, such as art, science, or education. Their target is everything. Down with reality, they proclaim, and with value, virtue, achievement, and the struggle to do better, to rise to the top down with the high flyers, the requirements of survival, and the whole human race. And all of this explicitly, not to reach any beneficial result, but for its own sake, as an end in itself. 
Now just watch the following progression. In the 19th century, men entered the race of life at different starting points, according to whatever assets they were given or had created. And fairness they held is men's equal freedom to run. In the 20th century, we were told that the race is fair only if everyone, through government aid, starts at the same point. Now, at the dawn of the 21st century, we are told that to be fair, the men leading the race must have their legs broken so that the losers can catch up. I don't think the philosophic precursors of egalitarianism ever imagined its full implications. And even though they didn't, they always postponed its rule. The Christians preached equality as an ideal to be realized in the next life. The Marxists preached equality, but not now, only for the final stage after the withering away. But now we have a movement that says there is no more delay. We're going to do it. We're going to enforce it now. Now I think it's obvious that like all forms of nihilism, this is a rejection of the quest for unity. Life, according to their theory, is to be a whimsy of redistributions, or if I can put that in unfriendly terms, a whimsy of killing. It's entirely the many without the one, obviously, D2. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for coming and listening so intently to material that's often very abstract. I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for that. I was told that I had two standing ovations in absentia. So it's nice to get one that's real. <laughs> I'll just wrap up my conclusions this way. I am going to compare, after I've got the whole picture in front of me, the demise of Greece and the present state of the United States. It's common to use the United States and Rome. Uh, the, the two I societies are Greece and the United States. And the question is, what happened to one and what's the difference now? Both of those societies, by the way, stopped dead rapidly. Uh, they were the shortest periods, about 100, 150 years at their climax, and then they were just completely overthrown. And the question is, why? And what is that forecast uh, for the future? The ancients had a long, long period of M1 from 300 BC, say 400 AD when Christianity became a real factor, 700 years in which the secularism and the uh, perceptual, conceptual tie remained. Uh, the whole pagan world remained, even though now in the shadow uh, of God. Uh, and uh, if uh, we were, had the luxury of a long drawn out M1 the way they did, I have no doubt in the world, not any, that uh, objectivism uh, would triumph. The problem is that M1 is dead as a factor. It's interesting that it was starting in the universities right after uh, the beginning of the 19th century. A perfect M1 movement was taking over the colleges. 
Uh, and it looked for a minute like, you know, it was going to overthrow, uh, you know, the romantic and so on and give a, uh, give a whole uh, new a M1, which is just what happened before. And it was aborted totally about the time of the Civil War. And it's about the time of the Civil War, just after, that all our manifestations disappeared. Romantic literature, pretty soon uh, Newton in favor of 19th century positivism, etc. So the question is, what happened in the United States was unprecedented in history, because what took over was not a gradual move toward uh, religion, which has a essentially rational possibility underneath it, uh, and lots of time to, for education of a new view, but the hammer blow of Kant. And he had never taken over the whole period since, uh, say, 1870, has been Kant through and through. And all you have is uh, uh, D1 and D2 alternating with an occasional M2, uh, like in physics today, the string theory. But the dominant has been D1 and D2. And uh, I, I think I proved conclusively in the book that people simply can't live with uh, a, a form of D. They can live with I, and they can live with M, and they can live with M2 in the sense of there was a thousand years uh, of M2 in the Middle Ages and people could live with it. But they cannot live uh, with D2 because they have to have something to guide them and the whole of D2 is, is destructive. So the question is only uh, what is going to uh, replace uh, all these Ds? And if, if I'm right that M1 is dead, it's, it's either a new I or it's M2. Further, I, I argue that the secular version of uh, M2 is dead. It has been tried. It lasted a short period of time, both communism, etc. And I don't think that, uh, I think it's in the nature of it. I discussed that also. So if M2 is going to win, it's going to be religious. Uh, and if you look at the whole of history, I think you'll see that that's compatible with it. Man started, and the whole prehistory, as we infer it, would have to have been religious because he didn't yet have the idea of concepts and logic and control. It was fear and the unintelligible and anthropomorphism. There was no way out of that. You couldn't imagine a species evolving into atheism. So he started with religion. That was his whole frame of reference, his whole moral code, and his whole philosophy. Now, gradually, they got more skills, but still the pre-Greek civilizations were absolute you know, theocracies or, or close to it. Greece somehow broke free of that, but not completely. Uh, not complete, enough so they are I. But did you know that Athens to the end had laws prescribing penalty for atheism? And you know what happened to Socrates for worshiping uh, false gods? Aristotle, even though it's a platonic element, has uh, the founding fathers, uh, has uh, the prime mover. And uh, the founding fathers, you know, have their deistic god and sometimes sound quite religious, especially uh, in their ethics. There has never been what the, the, the graph has been, deeply religious, a momentary, and then a disaster. Now, the disaster for, for Athens was basically military, uh, uh, both the Peloponnesian War and then the Macedonian War that wiped them out. Uh, so that's more understandable. Then we stayed with religion for a 1,000 years. And then a long M1 period, and then gradually, not quite to the level of the Greeks, because we never got education to that level, and then almost immediately. But this time now, the disaster was Kant. And Kant puts an enormous pressure on the time frame. 
Because you can live with M1 for a long time, as, as, as has been proven. But you cannot live with D1 for a long time because people rebel. They simply can't survive. They, they can't name it, but they know that nihilism uh, is a disaster. And everything else is just disintegrating. There are no values, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they go to the only place they've always gone to, which is religion. And that's why you have 40 or 50 million uh, Christians. And the problem is they have no opposition. M1 is gone, the Ds can't be lived with, and there is no I. So there's no place for the country to go but into some kind of religious dictatorship. The only out is time. It's going to take them some time to get there from here, because even Bush, and you see now maybe some of you who thought I was such a monster for saying you shouldn't vote for Bush, what the reason is why Bush is an unqualified disaster. The Democratic Party is D1. They're no threat. The Republican Party is becoming M2. They are the threat. So if you say, well, they're a health care planner, I don't give a damn what. It's better than the Democrats, therefore I'm voting for them. You do not know what a philosophic factor is. What is moving a culture? I was... It doesn't make any difference what they do to taxes if they then say property is a sin. So I can, no, let me go back to where I was. You see, just from Bush, the extent to which he was starting to push in religion, faith-funded alternatives and, and uh, you know, initiatives and uh, stem cell research and appointing these incredible people to the Food and Drug Administration, et cetera, uh, he was making a big inroad. And if that is not nipped in the bud, and it certainly doesn't look like it's going to be, that is a real threat. How long would it take? I can't answer that. I mean, I'd have to be Nostradamus. But I don't think, I mean, I can easily be to say that I'll be dead when the truth comes out. Uh, I don't think it can go on 50 years, uh, 40 years, something like that, is all I can see before, the other sides will all have collapsed. The Democrats are already saying, we believe in God too, and Hillary is going around. You know, now she doesn't really, but not in the way the Republicans do. But she has to say it. Uh, that, that's the scary part. Now, on the other hand, uh, the hope is the objectivists. If they could get into the culture, into literature, into science, into education, and that would have to come before politics. Uh, you know, in the philosophy department, then uh, how long would it take to be enough of a force to sway the country in an election uh, or to make an election so uncertain that the person has no mandate and has to be careful? Uh, we get to that stage in time. It's an issue of time. If you, how long would that take? I, I don't know. That seems to me, I don't want to be a downer, but it seems to me that's going to take longer. But I don't know. I have no, uh, no crystal ball. And I think the progress that has been made in objectivism is far beyond what I would have guessed. And I'll close just with this. The, uh, I want to close my book with the story of Thermopylae, as I did my course, because that is the real situation. Something like a million uh, Persians were uh, invading the West, and if they had conquered Greece, that would have been the end of Western civilization in the cradle before it started. And 300 Spartans stood on this pass. I get emotional. Uh, Thermopylae, <coughs> gates of fire. 300 against almost a million, and stopped them. Now, every one of them died to the last man but they stopped this force, which one would have said is impossible. I mean, how can 300 people stop a million? Uh, and uh, the Athenians and the rest were able to get their act and their materials and so on together. And they won the battle and repulsed uh, the Persians. Well, you know who the Persians are today. But uh, it's really the internal Persians. And I don't mean Persians 
Americans that uh, is the threat. But if the Spartans could do that on physical terms, can we do that on intellectual terms? Because it's about the same numbers, 300 against uh, a million. Uh, maybe even worse. Now, I think we have 300, but they have like 40 million at least ready. So uh, on the other hand, we have the internet and things like that. So we have Ayn Rand. You can't, you can't make a prediction, but I think you can prove which of those three can't be the ones. And which is the one that has the biggest lead uh, right now? Now, maybe you think I'm weaseling out of a prediction. I, I'm under strict instructions from your own, from John Allison, do not close with something negative. So, <laughs> that's the best I can say. Thank you.